I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we discuss the latest updates from the battlefront, the mood in the EU, and the details of the latest military aid package to Ukraine from the United States. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in fate. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Tuesday, the 9th of August, day 167. And today, I'm joined by the Telegraph's defence and security editor, Dominic Nichols, and our Brussels correspondent, Joe Barnes. I started off by asking Dom for the latest news from Ukraine. Hi, David. Hi, everybody. It's been a a fairly active period in the last 24 hours, back in the Donbass, actually. Uh, we've been talking recently about the, the move south of many Russian forces to, to reinforce the Kurzon, um flank. Uh, but there's also been, a, we, there has been a lot of activity still in the Donbass. There is still a lot of activity in the Donbass. We shouldn't forget that. Russia's still very active there. Although the latest UK defence intelligence estimate says that for all their activity, they've only, they're only making the marginal gains that we've seen of late the other other news is that um, the latest uh, U.S. military aid package was announced yesterday. Another a billion dollars that takes to the total to 9.8 billion since Joe Biden has been in power, and I think just short of 12 billion since 2014. This latest uh, latest package includes more uh, ammunition for HIMARS, although notably not not ATACMs. I think that is off the table for for now. Um, but HIMARS ammunition. Uh, 75,000 rounds of 155 mil, so tube launch artillery, uh, 20, 120 mil mortars and 20,000 rounds of ammunition to go with it. Some NASAMs, that's the uh, National Advanced Surface to Air Missile System, the US Norwegian Surface to Air, Advanced Surface to Air Missile System, 1,000 Javelin anti-tank uh, uh, munitions and um, and some other some other uh uh, uh, bits and bobs but uh but those are the, those are the main the main parts i mean this is this is this is good this is still um still going in the right right direction um it's good to see that it is still getting through through the us system with with minimal uh contradiction um or opposition also of note it looks like uh america has been supplying anti radiation missiles so air launch anti-radiation missiles. As Colin Carl, the Undersecretary of Defence Policy, said uh, in, a, in a press conference yesterday, said that, quote, a number, um, no more details than break, but a number of, uh, of anti-radiation missiles have been sent in recent aid packages, although none of them were actually listed in the, the aid packages that I can see going, going back. Um, CNN reporting that a defence official told them that this, uh, that the anti-radiation missile was the AGM-88 high-speed anti-radiation missile made by Raytheon 50 kilometre range and um uh and a very a very potent weapon now this this is important because these uh missiles home in on electromagnetic emissions from from ground stations so if you're a surface air russian surface air missile battery um and you are you're you're actively looking for for aircraft in the sky then you'll be emitting emitting a signal which can be picked up by one of these missiles or the aircraft operating it and the 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 missile can then be targeted against that um against that position now it's unlikely uh, just just um looking around sort of comment from trusted sources unlikely that of the of the three modes that the the harm agm88 missile can operate in unlikely that it'll be targeted by the aircraft itself because the aircraft that, that they're probably firing from can't speak to the missile however the missile can be pre-programmed before launch so it's suggested that u.s and uk um, rivet joint signals intelligence aircraft are are hoovering up all the the um, electromagnetic emissions from the battlefield and then this is being crunched and turned into uh, a data set for these missiles to go and hit so so quite a, a serious undertaking there and what that means is that if they if ukraine can stop Russia from operating its radars at the S-300, S-400 surface air missile systems, the, the radars associated to them, that then frees them up to to be able to use the sky for their own ends um, with with less risk. So harm, uh, a very capable weapon, uh, not not as not as significant, I think, as high mass, but still a very significant weapon if if that's being sent, which is uh, which is very interesting. Um, 
Colin Carl also said that Russian, the Pentagon are estimating that Russian casualty figures are 80,000. So that's killed and wounded. But 80,000 is a staggering number and just, just underlines what we've been saying for a long time, that, that the Russian army is being broken in this endeavour in Ukraine um, to, to, what, to what costs for the rest of the security um, concerns Russia has. We wait, wait to see. But I mean, that they are expending their army on this, which is just ridiculous. The only, the only other thing to note is that uh, in the last hour, Finland, it's been announced Finland is going to join um, Canada, the Netherlands and New Zealand in training Ukrainian troops in Britain. Um, so about 20 Finnish instructors going to join a couple of hundred Canadians. Um, I'm not sure how many Dutch and, and New Zealanders are in there, but uh, uh, they, they're training in, in Britain now. Um, Again, a few hundred uh, Brits training them over here as well. And this sort of follows on. So since 2014, um, Britain supported, with others, supported Orbital, which was training the U Ukrainian military in low-level infantry tactics. And it's estimated that about 22,000 Ukrainian soldiers went through op Orbital. Um, this this plan to train, uh, to take new recruits, basically, and train them up to a basic infantry level, uh, hosted in, in Britain, but from, with the international response, this is part of the plan to have a rolling 120-day program getting getting civilians up to um, basic basic infantry level, basic just sort of pairs far and movement, nothing nothing beyond that. But it, yeah, that initial sort of 10 or 12 week initial training, which is uh, which is the bedrock of any of, of all soldiering. So interesting that Finland has uh, has joined the joined the group there, uh, and I'll take a pause. Just very quickly, Don, before we go to Cho, um, what, what's the reason why they're, they're training just in Britain? Um, sh sh is, isn't there not an argument for training some of the Ukrainian soldiers in Finland or in, or in the Netherlands? Why, why, why is Britain being used as the base for this? Well, I mean, the, the other, other training packages are going ahead. So we know that, for example, the US is training Ukrainian artillerymen, uh, gunners in, in Germany. So other, other bits and pieces are happening around the edges. This, this infantry package was put together it was announced by Boris Johnson and then and then backed up by the British British MOD I think because uh, Britain was the framework nation for the JEF the 10 nation joint expeditionary force which is the kind of North European uh, group of beer drinkers and hellraisers those will actually turn up on day one so JEF was the original sort of framework around which this thing was built and obviously um, you know Canada and New Zealand aren't, aren't part of JEF but, it, but, but that's being used as the mechanism to get this going and so I think it was I think it was the um, the initiative by by Br Britain to start this and um, you know it, it's it's great supplying personnel that is you know skin in the game but yeah, the infrastructure and the training areas and and uh, the proximity to Ukraine, basically, I think it just sort of suited that that Britain was was in the right kind of place and was was leading the charge there. But um, uh, it's not to say, as I said, that, that there is not training going on elsewhere across uh, across Europe. Thanks, Tom. Um, Joe Barnes, before we talk more broadly about the mood in the EU and the latest news from Brussels, uh, we've just published a story. It's about three, four, five minutes ago um, that you've written with Natalia Vasilyeva, our Russian correspondent, about uh, Vladimir Zelensky, the Ukrainian president's call for Europe to ban uh, Russians from uh, Russian holiday makers from Europe. Can you tell us about this? Why has he made this call? So it's, um, it's part of Zelensky. Throughout the war, he's kind of tried to coax Western leaders into following the root of tougher sanctions. Um, but actually, it's not kind of all of his idea. So he may have said, and he quoted in an American newspaper, the most important sanctions are to close the borders because Russia Russians are taking someone else's land. And he suggested that Russians should live in their own world until they change their philosophy. So it's quite tough talking, and kind of that's the rhetoric we expect from Vladimir Zelensky, the Ukrainian president. But actually, what we've seen more recently across the Baltic states and Finland... Um, where they uh, they actually have kind of history with border Russia, um, are ways uh, EU leaders in Latvia have already shut the border and of their land crossing to Russia. Finland is exploring how it can restrict holiday makers. So it's looking, can it, you within the Schengen EU free travel zone, restrict people coming in from its land border from Russia? Does it stop holiday makers? But it, does it let people like students or potentially people who have relatives living in Finland come to visit? Um, Estonia has joined calls for a big EU-wide ban on issuing visas to Russia. So it's, it's really this kind of movement which is born out of uh, we 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 in Brussels call them the sanction easters. Uh, they're the kind of the hardline 
states. It's Poland, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania who are really kind of pushing for harder sanctions on, on Russia because of the war in Ukraine. And this is essentially, they've put forward ideas to uh, the next step for the what would be the EU's seventh package of sanctions, and that's to ban Russian tourists. And Vladimir Zelensky has jumped on that and said, look, guys, this is a good thing. You should do that. This is how we should support Ukraine in the future. Thanks, Joe. And what right now would you say is the mood in Brussels? When you talk to diplomats and to politicians, what, what, what kind of things are you hearing about the EU's attitude to, towards the Ukraine war? So it, it, it fluctuates on the day to day. So there's been a lot of interest in the power plant of Zaporizhia uh, for obvious reasons, because there's a lot of rhetoric coming out that it's going to be a Chernobyl style disaster if the kind of the worst happens there. Um, but then you actually look, a lot of countries are now focusing more in on their cost of living crisis. And uh, so there's like huge inflation. The, the euro, if you look into kind of Italian mines, is about to collapse and we're heading for this kind of terrible recession. But th- there's still a lot of focus where people kind of understand and they can pinpoint a lot of what's happening on Russia. But w- what now, we're in Brussels, we're in the, su- we're in the summer holiday period. So actually, um, I, was just, I went into the European Commission earlier and there is hardly anyone in uh, at work. So they, they, if you speak to people inside the Commission, they insist they are kind of working actively on this uh, seventh package of EU sanctions. But then I spoke to some diplomats earlier and they were like, oh, God, we haven't heard anything. We've not heard from the Commission. They've not tabled any proposals. We don't expect to have conversations at our level, at a European kind of ministerial level, until the end of the month. So it's a, it's a real interesting kind of conundrum where, yes, there's this war going on in Ukraine, but Europeans won't let that get in the way of their traditional summer holidays. Joe, can I just jump in here and ask a question? This idea about visa bans and travel bans for Russian citizens... I guess this is this is to attack on every front and and make the uh, the experience of so, uh, of Russian society just just so uncomfortable uh, or annoying that they then put pressure on their political leaders. I, I guess that's the the rationale behind it. I mean, what's the thinking around European capitals that you're picking up? Does, does this is this actually? Do you think this is likely to work given the given the the limited voice russian society has politically i mean i just wonder if this is if they have any data or any uh, suggestion that that what they're basing this upon because it does seem like it could it could backfire russia uh, putin in particular is very keen to portray this as a war against against all all russians that we that we hate everybody and and and, and you know we, we we they they have to resist the, the west at every at every turn and i just wonder if the, what the thinking is here from the EU, or if they're, if they're moderating their position, or, or, or have any data to back up their initial assumptions? So, at, as it stands, the idea of a visa ban is not kind of an EU proposal. It's a proposal by the kind of the hardline sanction easters: uh, Lithuania, Latvia, Poland, uh, Estonia. So, these kind of countries that have got kind of history living under the Soviet Union, so and who have historically been tough on Russia. Um, but what it does point towards, and I was having this conversation with someone earlier, is originally they targ- the EU targets and well, Western targets was oligarchs, people that were close to Putin. And they thought by targeting them, making their lives hell uh, in Europe or America or in England would then feed back to the Kremlin and it would basically start building leverage. And they, they've discovered that hasn't worked. We're now five months into the war. We've sanctioned kind of hundreds of billions of euros, dollars, pounds between us. Um, and it's it's not had any effect. Vladimir Putin is still pushing ahead. So now you look down and you like almost as a trickle down effect, you start looking at the middle classes of Russia. And that's they are they are the kind of people because um, it's not easy to get out of Russia at the moment. You have to uh, all flights from main, mainland Russia and uh, into Europe and America and England, the UK, a ban. So you'd have to fly in somewhere like Istanbul to Serbia and then take an onward connecting flight from there into um, into our territories. So basically what they're looking at doing, and, and it's more of a hope, there's no data to back it up, is just that the more you make Russian life misery, like Russian life miserable, hopefully that has some sort of kind of effect where it rumbles back and ultimately probably doesn't lead to regime change, but it leads to Vladimir Putin saying, oh, I've got a bit of a problem domestically. People are starting to uh, 
feel a bit discontented with the war. Thanks, Joe. Can I ask a question about Germany? Um, the, there's a study from the Institute for Employment Research that's come out, I believe it was yesterday, today, that says that Germany's economy is going to lose more than 260 billion euros in added value by 2030 due to the Ukraine war and high energy prices. Um, what's your sense from talking to, to, to Germans, to German diplomats, politicians, about Germans' attitudes to the war? Can you give, a, can you give our European listeners and our American listeners a, a sense of how the Germans are, th- are thinking of it right now? So the, the, the Germans have sought to position themselves because of kind of early criticism with whether it be kind of slow and laborious deliveries of weapons, maybe not too keen to go into energy sanctions. They tried to position themselves on kind of almost the right side of history as such. But what we are seeing is, and it's a, a matter of fact, the, the German industry is kind of fueled by Russian energy deliveries. It is, it is dropping as a result of the war. But previously, uh, as of last year, Russia imported 55% of its gas from Russia. So that's a huge, huge amount. And it's kind of, it's hard to shift. So basically, this is what we're seeing is kind of the price of shifting away from what was kind of cheap and reliable energy kind of shipments from Russia. Um, so it's, it's, not, it's not a shock that this is happening. Um, the Germans recently um, were a big kind of driver between behind the European Union efforts to cut gas consumption fifteen uh, percent over the winter months to avoid kind of any energy crunch. Um, they, they're basically relying at the moment on kind of this idea of EU solidarity, um, the hope that kind of European nations will help them out as much as possible um, when push kind of push comes to shove on kind of energy supplies. And alike, um, we, so we we we've covered things like if uh, there's a Russian gas shut off over the winter, Germany could run short on toilet roll because that's quite a energy intensive process to manufacture, um, and other kind of paper products like newspapers and and they, they they've got their emergency kind of energy plans in place where at the moment they're asking kind of people to be sensible. Uh, they've turned down. Heat, turned off heating in public buildings. They've stopped heating outdoor swimming pools, um, and so and such, and asked people to like cut uh, kind of air conditioning during the summer. So they they are really looking to the future. But they this is all in aid to basically keep their industrial kind of hub open and keep factories powered. Um, and they know they can't do that um, as it stands at the moment. So they're going to probably have to look at kind of cutting back. Maybe do they go to some sort of like COVID style lockdown, but in terms of energy where you kind of you mandate what industries can open on what days? Um, do, do they put work from home mandates to stop people using their cars or public transport and things like that? This is all, all stuff for the future. But at the moment, they, there's no kind of doubt around Europe that Germany is under the cosh because of its kind of historical ties with Russia, uh, where it's gone for its cheap and easy fuel. Thanks, Joe. Just very quickly as well, do you get a sense from uh, Germans of, of how, I mean, how are they feeling about this? Do they feel that even though they might be asked to cut back and their industry could be in trouble, that actually, you know, they're still positive about it because it is the right thing to do? Or is there a sense of any domestic or political unrest? I, I, at the moment, I think they still see it as it's the right thing to do. Um, they appreciate that everyone is backing Ukraine in this. But I think and th- th- this isn't just for Germany, this is for other countries. As it kind of comes to the harsh winter months, um, when potentially people aren't able to heat their homes or energy bills are through the roof, are governments going to feel under pressure to start changing the way that they support Ukraine? Are they going to suggest that maybe Russian energy is the way through their own crisis? We, 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 we honestly, we don't... We don't know. People People at the moment, they talk tough and they, they, they're saying the right thing. They're, they're saying that we are there through thick and thin uh, with Ukraine. Um, the Germans are actually quite an interesting case study in this. Um, so Olaf Scholz, uh, probably because of um, the pressure from his coalition partners in the Greens, who are quite hardline against Russia, they've, they've definitely they've, they've changed their tone um, a fair bit. They, um, they previously didn't want to provoke Russia. But now, now, now they're kind of they've joined in and they're they're pushing what would be a more Western, a more European line about the war in Ukraine. Whether it be kind of blaming Russia, maybe being a bit more provoking, sending bigger weapons, stronger weapons, uh, joining in on trading missions and stuff like that, and 
trying to find a way for Ukraine to end the war on its own terms rather than kind of shoddy peace deals that we've feared in the past. Thanks, June. Just uh, pulling away from Germany, obviously at the beginning of the war, at the beginning of the invasion, um, Emmanuel Macron was in the news quite a lot, talking to Putin, going to Moscow. Um, what, uh, what, what would you do? I mean, we haven't really heard a lot from France recently. What's the French attitude? How's the French attitude uh, and commitment changed over the last few months? Do you get a sense from Paris about what people are, th- are thinking there? Um, I think Emmanuel Macron, he initially um, probably, slightly because of his own oversized ego, wanted to become kind of the West's interlocutor with um, Vladimir Putin. And he saw himself as someone that could kind of negotiate a way out of this war. And I think the more and more he spoke to him, the more and more he realised that that Vladimir Putin was playing him for a fool and decided it was foolish and you can't negotiate with this man, with this guy. Um, And I think that's that's always been the British attitude. Um, You basically can't negotiate with a lunatic. And I think now that is uh, that's happened in Paris. And Paris is Paris is being um, is being good on weapons. It's sending a lot of weapons and aid. Um, it's backed uh, sanctions and it helped uh, draft a lot of the EU sanctions as it held the rotating presidency from January through to uh, June of this year. So a lot, all pretty much all of its sanctions were drafted with French officials in mind. And they're they're of the same. They're not as affected by Russian energy, so they can afford to be a bit more hardline on that front because they have their own nuclear power stations, which Germany is obviously looking to phase out. But I think they're also using this war in Ukraine as an opportunity to kind of further their own EU kind of areas, such as whether it be kind of strategic autonomy, as they call it, the the idea of a European army. While they're not asking for kind of a European badged army, what they're pressing the commission to do is draw up plans uh, for things like EU-funded discounts if EU nations buy Raphael fighter jets or they buy uh, French artillery systems uh, for their armies rather than looking at the traditional Lockheed Martin planes or HIMARS or things of that uh, kind of ilk. So... The French, I think, have identified this as a good way of furthering their EU agenda, but also they are, they're actually quite resolute in how they back Ukraine. Um, and I think Emmanuel Macron has learned his lesson from being made to look a bit daft by Vladimir Putin and probably won't speak to him again for the foreseeable anyway. And Joe, just one more, one final one for me, if I may, please. So this week, well, last week, we, we saw all the, uh, the rumpus over Taiwan and Nancy Pelosi's visit and, and China's response to it. Um, I mean, li- linked to tangentially linked to to Ukraine, but a lot of the same similar themes about um, sovereignty and, and Im- imperialism and, and all the rest of it. Could you just give us a flavour of, of, of how last week's or the, the current crisis of Taiwan was viewed amongst the, uh, the the European capitals and the folk you've been speaking to? Yes, again, it's it's quite an interesting theme, and it the, I think the theme of reliance runs through. Uh, Russia and Ukraine and Taiwan and China. So Taiwan is the biggest kind of exporter of microchips and micro microchips and semiconductors. That's basically the basic, the core of our technology in the West. And if China was to have control of that, we would instantly find a situation where it could turn off the taps of the technology markets, much like Russia's doing with gas and oil and coal and stuff like that. Um, but the, the other one, we, we seem to draw a lot on, uh, you and I, Dom, had a piece in the Sunday Telegraph about how intelligence sources kind of point towards the fact that President Xi of China has learned lessons from Vladimir Putin about how the West responds. So there's the idea that he would have to take Taiwan within 48 hours because that would render the West response useless, whereas Vladimir Putin failed to take Kiev in that sort of time span and it allowed the West to pump in some pretty serious kit to put huge sanctions under Russia and basically cripple it um, while it's still got a war ongoing whereas the Westerners know that as soon as Taiwan falls to China it's not coming back so there there is acute fear and acute worry about how you handle this Um, and again there's there's, there's differing differing opinions some and one of this basis is France and Germany 
probably don't believe American and British intelligence when they say that an invasion will happen. We we say it's when, not if, and the French and Germans are saying it's probably if, not when. So the, the, we're going to see basically these similar running themes up until anything drastic does happen. But I think the, the basic warning is that we, if anything happens with Taiwan and China, it changes the whole relationship between the West and China forever. And there's basically there's no coming back from, from that if it's in charge of the majority of the technology sectors that we basically use for our microwaves, our dishwashers, our cookers, our cars, every, basically everything in our laptops, our mobile phones, everything we're using to listen to this Twitter space today would be under Chinese control, essentially. And it would make the world a very difficult place for us to live. Well, thanks, Joe. Uh, Joe, just from from your perspective, is there anything uh, you want to talk about or mention that we, we haven't got to so far? Um, so there's a interesting kind of... Um, we look at a lot of countries cracking down on Russia, and we've, we've spoken about this in the past few weeks, about where does Russia see its allies? And we're seeing a lot of involvement between um, Russia and Iran at the moment. So um, the Iranians have purchased a, a satellite that's been launched by the Russians, but on the basis of it's going to be used for the next few months to spy on the war in Ukraine. And what we're also seeing a lot is... Um, it looks like they're doing a lot of um, deals on drones and kind of technology like that that could be used in the war in Ukraine, all in exchange for Iran wants Soviet, basically, fighter jets. So it's a, there's, a, there's a lot of kind of cooperation going on there, which I think we should look out for in the next few months, because we've the West have targeted Belarus for its part in the war. But is Iran potentially going to be in the crosshairs of Western sanctions if it continues to kind of do shady deals with Moscow. Um, and the other one I'd, I'd say on that is uh, there's been a bit of worry about Turkey on this front. So President Erdogan went to see President Putin in Sochi recently, and they spoke about doing deals on energy and other kind of trade. And we know Turkey, being a NATO ally and a member of the NATO military alliance, um, has previously been kind of excluded from American fighter jet programs, be the F-16 and the F-35 for its attempts to buy uh, S-400 rocket systems from Russia. So I I just look that maybe Putin is trying to manoeuvre a bit around his allies now and almost testing the waters about how far the West will go to basically stop his effort to circumnavigate Western sanctions by trading with new and existing partners. I think that's a really interesting thing that we should keep our eye on as the summer goes on. Thanks, Joe. Just quickly, Dom, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, how effective is the kit that um, Iran possesses? I mean, and th- these drones, do we know how effective they are? Do we have a sense of that at all? Um, no, I don't. I don't have a sense at all. I don't know them at all. I'll, I'll have to look into that, to be perfectly honest. But I think Joe raises an interesting point there about about equipment. If, we th- if you look at um, the number of countries around the world that have bought very heavily from Russia and um, and they've now seen the, the kit that they've bought that might not do what it says on the tin. I think there's going to be a certainly an examination of that, maybe maybe even a backlash against against Russia. They, they, I could imagine their international arms sales will, will fall off a cliff. And I'm thinking of countries like like India that's very heavily hedged with Russian equipment. Um, and I, I wonder if there's a is a, is a threat and an opportunity here for for Western countries, principally the US, I guess, and the arms on the arms side of life, the, the arms industry to to go in there and say, well, look, that kit might not work, but this stuff you have seen does work. And we, we can offer sort of, sort of soft um, security guarantees because, you know, this, this kit is works and we, and, we'll, and we have got strong ties, et cetera, et cetera. I just wonder if there's a if there's a diplomatic angle to this uh, or, uh, and whether or not there's some responsibility that that countries would seek to place upon the West for for, for for showing Russian kits to be not as good as it was supposed to be. I, w- I wonder if there there might even be a, a slight backlash against the West that, that some countries might feel they've been left out in the in the cold by having the the kit they own so so obviously shown up to be second rate. So I just think the whole arms industry side of this war is is, is absolutely fascinating. I mean, we covered the report yesterday from RUSI, the Royal United Services Institute, the think tank here, defence security think tank here in London, that talked about the number of 
the amount of Western components that go up to make some of the most highly sophisticated of weapons in Russia's arsenal, the cruise missiles and the electronic warfare kit and so on and so forth. Um, if you've not read it, please, I recommend people go and have a look at our report and, and others were covering it. And the and the paper itself is now live on Rus's website. So very interesting angle there. But I just think that, like I said, the arms industry side of this, the business side and what it, what that will do to diplomacy and um, opportunities and threats, as I've described, uh, going forward, particularly for countries who, who have who have relied very heavily on on Russian equipment that that hasn't necessarily acted as they uh, as they thought it would. Thanks, Tom. Joe, I know you had some thoughts on India there. Yeah, so India is an interesting case study. So uh, previous estimates have kind of put almost ninety percent of its military hardware is has kind of Soviet origins, and more recently, kind of studies have looked into uh, India's uh, top five armed, armed suppliers. And 49% of that was from Russia. And as little as uh, 13% was the US, Israel was 13%, and France was 18%. And so Boris Johnson, our outgoing prime minister, made a big, big play of this in April when he went to visit uh, India on a, on a visit there um, to see their prime minister, Modi. And he basically said, he thanked Modi for India's support and kind of stand against Russia. And one of the things that he offered was a route into kind of more to boost exports of Western arms to, to India, basically saying, look, we can help you replace a lot of that kit. So that diplomacy is really ongoing. And I think it's, it's, it's seen as a really important kind of weapon that the UK and the West has um, in the kind of defeating Russia is ultimately great drying up its main business, its main businesses revenue. And it's kind of military allies by saying now we can give you better kit and uh, i think as dom said it's a, it's a really important area of diplomacy that can kind of carry on and, and probably should carry on as we move forward well we had a few uh, thank you thank you joe thank you dom we had a few questions from listeners but we're starting to run out of time so i'm just going to choose one uh, linked to the discussion we've just been having uh, this is from hans christoph uh, or hans christoph thank you very much for sending in the question he writes Doesn't the example of Ukraine and the rising tensions regarding Taiwan show that, unless you are covered by a NATO Article 5 construction, you better get nukes? How does the arms industries in the respective Western countries react to this rising demand, and how do governments drive this or not? So I think that the central question there is, yeah, doesn't the example of Ukraine uh, show that, unless you are covered by something like Article 5, you better get nukes? Uh, Dom Nichols, would you like to comment on this? Yeah, sure. And Hans Krasov, thanks for the the question. I think it really neatly boils down... A very central issue here, and, I, and I'm I'm inclined to agree. This this is this war has shown that all the different layers and different colours of of collective security and these treaties and those arrangements and partners and allies and what do all these things mean. You're right. You boil it down, and and it's becoming very apparent that unless there is an overarching security guarantee that is that is credible um, and communicated to the other side, such as Article Five. Um, then you could be in hot water, and I and I think, I think, this is this is either going to lead to a clarity in the international sort of geopolitical diplomacy field, whereby people recognise that yes, you've got to have hard alliances and hard guarantees, otherwise it's just not not worth it. Um, I, I wonder if the days are done of of these these sort of. I, I look at Jeff, for example, the, as I say, the Joint Expeditionary Force, 10 nations, North North European countries. Um, I mean, there's no collective security guarantee there. We, we, we all exercise together and we all go and, go and sort of try and have common systems and processes and we can work alongside each other and all that kind of stuff. And that's great. But but we do that. Britain does that with many other countries around the world. Um, partners, not, not, not allies, not formal official allies, but we try and work with lots of different countries around the world. But though that's that's just sort of getting on with the neighbours, isn't it, or in, in the global commons. So I just wonder if when it comes to hard security and actually who's going to turn up on day one if someone kicks the door in and, and tries to tries to take over your house. I, I'm wondering if actually we are coalescing down to, no, it, it's Article 5 or similar, and, and there's nothing else. I mean, this, this is the first major, major test of this since the Second World War, or the, the first major test, I would say, to, since NATO has been in, in existence. And and it, uh, and it, you know, helpfully with a very small H, 
helpfully because Russia is a P5 member, permanent member of the Security Council in the UN. Um, and I think it is showing that, that hard security has to come with hard guarantees of, of alliances and partnerships and cooperations and all the rest of it is all very well and good and that, that those are all nice to have. But I I think, Hans Christoph, I think you're, you're right. I think it, it's Article 5 or nothing. Um, and I, I don't know if that's necessarily a good thing because if you're not in that club, then, th- then we've... The, the response to this war has been that we could rush to your humanitarian and economic aid and supply military arms, all of which is good. But I think this is showing that um, that those that want to chance their arm and get away with it or tr- try their luck on the international stage by, by going back to you know, imperialist mentality and just, just you know, might is right. I think this is I think there are some very glaring lessons here. Um, and I'm not sure if it's good that, that, that there's now this clarity that it's Article Five or nothing. I think that might might leave a lot of people feeling a little bit, a little bit isolated. Well, thank you very much, Dom. Um, so just to finish off, can uh, Dom and Joe, can I ask you for your just your final thoughts? Maybe sum up some of the things we've been talking about, or um, tell our listeners what they should be thinking of when it comes to Europe or Ukraine over the next few days. So my 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 kind of thoughts looking at the goings on in Ukraine is that there's a lot of noise building around the idea that Vladimir Putin, the Kremlin and kind of the Russian puppet authorities in the occupied territories are going to be looking to hold referendums. It's not, it's it's a, it's an age old kind of idea, but there seems to be a lot of momentum uh, gathering around Kherson, Militiapol, Mariupol, that they are going to try and confirm their almost annexation uh, and kind of make it pseudo official. And I think that's when we look at the next round of Western sanctions will be imposed is when kind of Vladimir Putin and his cronies in the Kremlin take that move to try and essentially put officialdom behind their annexations of certain areas of uh, Ukraine in the south. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Dom Nichols, would you like the final word? I mean, notwithstanding what I've just said about the strength of of Article 5 guarantees, there's 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 great merit in in working together on, in, on the international sphere. So all I'd say is that um, for operational or security reasons, I won't I won't say what or where, but I'm on the road for the next couple of days um, around around Europe with some senior mill pole folk. Hope to bring you bring you updates as as that happens. And th- this is uh, this is part of the ongoing process to to build this, this coalition of the willing, if you like, if that's not too loaded a term, against Russia in this war. Um, so yes, there there is merit in doing what you can when you can um like i say not not going back on what i just said to hans christoph's question but i think um i think yeah we'll see see, see some more in the next few days about the, the the continued international response so we need to keep this up over the summer as um, as joe said a lot large parts of the of the world especially europe closed down over the over august so we need to keep this uh, this steady drumbeat of of um, diplomatic military and political support going and um hopefully i'll be able to bring you some more on that in the next couple of days Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first 30 days completely free at telegraph.co.uk slash audio. And sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing podcasts at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Giles Gear, And today on Twitter, Claire Hubble.